What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Next Level Teaching. I'm your host, Jeremy Anderson, here with my super dope co-host, Miss Tori Rodriguez, a.k.a. T-Rod. What's, What's up, girl? Hey, Jay. How you feeling? I'm great. Man, we got the bearded gentleman in the house I today. I know. I am excited. Mike, let me this. make sure they got your Instagram. Yes. Right. It is at bearded period school period counselor. Yes. My man, That's Mike. Great. How you feeling, man? Doing good, man. How are you? Great. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thank you for having me. We had your wife on the previous episode. Yeah. She killed it. I, I know she did. No pressure. <laughs> yeah. That's, <laughs> no. That, yeah. That's, that's the one take wonder right there. The yeah. one take, take wonder. One take. <laughs> she qu- you got lucky with that one, let me tell you. I ya. did. I did. I think I you did. outpointed your coverage just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. Well, I'm excited to hop in with you because you're a counselor, and Mm -hmm. I think one of our first counselors that we've had on, is that correct? Mm -mm. No? Who Mm -mm. else we have? In the new season? In this season. Yes. 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 That's what Mm -hmm. I'm saying. Yes. So I'm excited because it gives educators a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Counselors get a shout out in this because Mm -hmm. let's be honest. We need more of you in our schools. Yes, Facts. yes. often the unsung heroes. Yes. Yeah, talk I about mean, it. let me tell you, I, like our counselor, she was my counselor. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I can't even imagine how many times you have teachers. Yeah, this year, um, I'd say definitely the, I always call it the COVID year. Yeah. Um, hmm. It was at an all-time high. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lots of educators coming in to just to express themselves and Vent their frustration sometimes, but also talk about just their home life, things that were going on at home. Yeah. They were just very difficult because we were all experiencing the same pains of COVID-19. Mm. So yeah. It was, it was, a, it was a lot. Um, <laughs> but nothing out of the ordinary, nothing that I wasn't prepared for right. yeah. through schooling and experience. So Yeah. yeah. Um, so actually, <clears throat> before we even hop into all this, because we got a lot to get into. Let's get- just get right into okay. it. Okay. So y'all gonna laugh, you're gonna learn, you're gonna live your best there life. There we go. That's that's, that's all I need to tell you right laugh, there. Learn and live your best life. Okay. Well, we about to learn from our man Mike. Yeah, go so how did you get into education? Because you've only been a counselor for three three years. Yeah. Um I, I took the long road. I always say that. Um my first job out of undergrad was as a preschool director at La Petite Academy. Okay. Mm. Shout out to La Petite yeah. Academy. Mm-hmm. I know they're still around and standing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um but I got my degree in um, experimental psychology, undergrad at University of South Carolina. Okay. And when I got out, I realized there wasn't a doggone thing I could do with just an undergrad in psychology, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. unless I wanted to work at a department store. Right. Wow. Um, so I realized quickly that I need to go back to school. Um, in my realization of that, I was already working at La Petite Academy as a preschool director. I went back and I before I decided to commit to going back to school, I realized I spent a lot of time talking to parents about their children. So I was kind of like, well, um, psychology, counseling, mm-hmm. it felt like a natural fit. So yeah. I went to Clark Atlanta University, shout out to CAU. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I went there for my master's. And I always tell the story because I kind of came to that fork in the road. Like you have to do your the, the, the courses that you have to complete first, like the courses that are mandatory for yeah. you to get your degree. Yeah. But after the first year, you mm-hmm. come to the fork in the road where you determine, are you going to do community mental health? Or are you going to do school counseling? Mm. I said, well, I can't really get an internship during the summertime in school. Mm. I want that degree. Let me go ahead and do community mental health. And I was already working at a, um, at a long-term psychiatric residential treatment facility anyway um, in a harbor. So I was working there. I was able to get my internship there instead of having to wait another semester to yeah. come on to do right. school counseling. Yeah. So really, that was really the only difference between me entering school counseling then Back in, I don't want to give my age away, but back in like oh <laughs> four, oh five, mm-hmm. and me waiting all the way to two thousand eighteen to end. Wow. wow! But I always say, if I had it, if I had to do it all over again, I would do it the same way. Yeah. Because of all the experience that I learned before entering into the school system. It was God's mm-hmm. plan A, not plan B. <laughs> yes. Um, so lots of experience. Um, Department of Juvenile Justice, as I said, uh, psychiatric residential treatment facility. Um. In addition to that, Department of Family and Children's Services, wow. Wow. Community Mental Health, Community Mental Health Director, like the IFE programs, if you guys are familiar with that, Intensive Family Intervention, which is the in-home mm-hmm. therapy component, Wow. Um, wraparound services, like 
I would dare say anything in social services. I probably have either been there, yeah. touched on it, or know someone who, well, not touched on it, did it <laughs> before I came into the school system. So. so so how was that crossover? How did you go from that to saying, now I'm going to go into schools? Right before, I think this was had to be around maybe 2012, 2013, somewhere around there where I was able to go ahead and take the the counselor examination for school counseling examination. Mm-hmm. Um, it was the case for school counseling. Yeah. And shortly when I was taking that, shortly before that, they had just said that it was a state mandate that was passed that said you could use your experience. Counselors, LPC, because I am a licensed professional counselor first and foremost. I always okay. say that. Um, just can't operate in that capacity within the school system. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was able to use that experience to obtain my certification as a school counselor. Gotcha. So I passed the case. I, did, I took the school counseling exam, passed it, but because I had already had all those years of experience, they looked and said, well... You don't have well, to do like your student teaching, yes, essentially. Yes, I didn't have it. to do yes. any of that. All, all the experience that I had like almost, oh man, almost a decade before mm-hmm. came into play. So I was yeah. able to obtain it that way. And then I had a couple of schools... Um, but is is something? But this, what what happened that made you say? Oh, now well, I'm going okay. into schools. So I'm getting a little bit into the home life. Um, mm-hmm. I actually, because that's the other job that I was working for, um, United Healthcare. So I even worked on the insurance aspect of it. Hmm. Wow. I know y'all are like, dang, this is he's seen it all. all. Um, so when the insurance aspect, meaning that whenever anyone calls, usually when someone's calling to be admitted to a um, treatment facility or obtain benefit information. I would be the person on the other end of the line trying to help them find the resources, explain to them what their benefits actually are, because a lot of times people will go to an out-of-network facility Mm -hmm. and not realize they didn't have out-of-network benefits. So when they get that large bill at the end, they're like, what happened? Well, you didn't have out-of-network benefits. However, so at that time, I was working from home because my beautiful wife had just delivered um, our fourth child. Okay. So it allowed me to work from home. So I stopped doing community mental health, worked for United Healthcare, and I was working from home for like three, four years. So I was able to be, um, I got domesticated around that time. You got guys. to be Mr. Mom for a <laughs> yes. little while. Yes, yes. Yep, yep. cooking dinner, make sure homework was done mm-hmm. like I was on it, in addition to working from home. Um, but then as our youngest, Eva, got older and school aged, I was like, you know, I'm a people person. I like to be around people. So. And I want to keep my eye on you, little girl. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, so I was able to, I, my wife and I, we had our, our family meeting. And it was, you know, we decided, hey. It's time for you to go back. Yeah. So I went back um, and I loved it. I, of course, well, I love it. Not loved. But I love it right. because I feel as though I chose elementary because I wanted to have a greater impact sooner. Yes. So a lot of people will say, well, you know, as a black male, you know, you usually find this in middle and high school, but not really in elementary. And definitely not as elementary. There even more. Yeah. Right. Um, So it's, you know, a lot of power in students being able to see what they can aspire to be. Mm -hmm. Mm. So being able to have that representation there earlier, to Mm -hmm. me, makes the greater impact. Yeah. So hopefully to my, you know, middle and high school teachers, educators, hopefully I'm able to plant that seed and it might not grow in my time, like while they're with me, but at least by the time they get to middle and high school, that seed starts to come into or grow into fruition. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, there's a big lack of of male involvement teachers, counselors, period. Mm -hmm. Um, Let alone black males. Right, black males specifically, you're right. And then you see more high than middle and but not much in the elementary. So so you saw a need and you went to fill the need. Yes. I love it. Absolutely. I love it. And um, how's it been? (laughs) I always say, because I've had counselors reach out or teachers reach out to me Mm -hmm. um, that are aspiring to be counselors and they'll say what grade level i always tell them there's always a difference because there's elementary middle and high of course but in elementary they make you feel like a rock star um, mm. <laughs> especially well let me let me preface that by saying if you are a person who is still has your finger on the pulse of the younger generation you can kind yes. of tell what's going on what's happening yes you know like you're able to kind of speak their language maybe not literally but you know figuratively speaking mm-hmm. yeah you're a rock star because they can come talk to you about any and everything. Yes. Um, they want to give you high fives. They want to have the special handshakes, you know, dap me up, you know, all of mm-hmm. that. Um, 
and for me, I love sneakers, so that's that's the automatic conversation starting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the kicks you have on right now, for real. I don't know if we was rolling before. Oh. Can you put them up so that, I, so that those who are watching on YouTube can see? I need a little that's a, that's assistance. A, that's a work of art right there. In this world. All right, you, heard, you heard I asked him, what size yeah. shoe you wear? And Jay said, don't yeah. worry, we'll get you some slides we'll you some on the slides. way out. Yeah, at least you're not going to send me out barefoot. No, nah, I appreciate I'm, I'll you. I'll get you it. some slides, man. Yeah, I just want to try them on one time. But no, so tell us about, I'm sure when they see that, they instantly feel like, man, he cool, he got dope sneaks. Yeah, it's it's an automatic conversation starter. Yeah, it, mm-hmm. like without I always say I was I've had an affinity for sneakers dating back to fourth grade when I was in fourth grade. Yeah, um, so it's kind of like you can make a statement without saying a word. Yeah, so the kids kind of like they automatically they see you walking down the hallway, they look at you and then they look at your shoes, look at you, it's like oh man, you got such and such. Oh man, and then before you know, it's just like connection. Oh, it's automatic connection. So hold on, so ta- sidebar, so that. <laughs> Now, I was about to say something as a joke, but this might actually be something. Because there are a lot of educators that's always asking, what can I do to build more of a connection? What can yes. I step your sneaker game up? Yeah. yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely step your sneaker game I, up. I can yeah. imagine them yeah. seeing like, okay, Miss Rodriguez, I, I see you with the short ones. Okay, so I just said a second ago, I'm going to need some help in that field. Yeah. But I have been working on my sneaker game recently. <laughs> and I have actually had a couple of students that were like, Miss yeah. Rod, the, yeah. like the t-shirt dress with the necklace and those sna- Yes. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, thank you. They were like, drip, drop, Miss Rod. Drip, just- drip. To my get the mop. <laughs> right, Thank you right. so much. <laughs> and then it. even if you can't, like even if that's not your thing, at least be I always say at least be aware of it. Yes. So if you see a, a student with the sneakers, and oftentimes, you know, it may be some of the more fashionable students in the school. Point it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have a conversation with them about that shoe. Like, you yeah. know, mm-hmm. like you want to meet them and make that connection because ultimately that makes your job as, it can make your job as an um, educator a lot easier. I right. think that this right here is a moment though that we need to talk about a little bit more because it's so hard because when I first started teaching, you know, especially as a middle school teacher, I'm 22 teaching 12 year olds. Right. So there's only a 10 year gap, right? Right. We a little bit further than that now. <laughs> we a little bit further than that. And there, having a student teacher in the classroom this past year has really taught me that I am not as relevant as I used to be, mm. but we as teachers have to stay relevant. Yes. Even if it's not who we are outside of the classroom, we still have to stay relevant. And that's something that my mom, I'm going to call her out, was <laughs> real good about for a long time. And I feel like she's lost a little bit of that okay. over the past mm. couple of years. And so that's something that I feel like I'm going to challenge A, my mom to, B, myself to, and C, some of you at home to. Right. Because... In order to have those connections with kids, we have to stay relevant. Yes. You may not love it outside of the school and your personal life, right. right? but you still need to know about it. You still need to you know, follow some of the people on Instagram that they follow. Listen, you don't have to listen to all of it. If you like, I do not love oh, yeah. music with explicit yeah. lyrics. Like that's just not my style. Right. So listen to the clean version. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Right, And then on top of that, go and play the instrumental version during class while they're working mm. independently. Yes. Keep it yes. relevant. Yes. Right. Because that is how you keep them engaged in your classroom. Right. Yes. Right. Yep. You're absolutely right. That's what makes the student want to come to your class as opposed to somebody else's It's class. a buy-in. Yeah. That's automatic buy-in. Just like that. Yeah. Just like that. Yeah. So I want to know a little bit more about how... Your previous job history and all of your previ- previous experience has played into and worked so well. Probably like Batman, like you got the tool belt where you <laughs> yes. got all sorts of things you can pull Because from. there was a lot that I'm sure Jeremy got a lot more of it because of your mm-hmm, background and mm-hmm, your degree work, mm-hmm. that I was like, for, for me, I was like, whoo, over the head on some of the, pro- some of the programs that you were working with. Okay, I got you. Yeah. But there were a few that I was like, okay. So I want to know how... What you've done in the past really incorporates into what you're doing now. How's it helped you? I think ultimately it's helped me because things that may happen in some schools, I would say just about any school, um, I don't have that big of a a 
my shock factor, I guess you could mm. say my shock meter, mm-hmm. yeah. is, is really, really high. Mm-hmm. So it has to be something that's extremely high for me to be like, oh, man, before I start, I'm not going to say pan- hitting panic mode, but I feel like some educators, when things, certain behaviors are expressed in the classroom, a lot of times it may be your reaction that they're feeding off of mm. that kind of makes them heighten it or ratchet that behavior up. Uh, so for me, coming from that background and being able to see so much in so many different arenas and in, in, within so many different capacities, I feel like I'm able to remain calm. And that sounds very simple, uh, very simplistic. But I say that because a lot of the, a lot of the issues that I've seen happen in classrooms, even before I became a school counselor, it has been some form or version of that where the student is, is able to have the pulse, their finger on the pulse of that teacher. Right. Mm. And at some point, it does become a power struggle, right? right. Because the student is wanting to that elicited behavior. Yeah. They're wanting that with the teacher. Yeah. Right. So being able to remain calm and just remove yourself and say, okay, all right, let's, you know what, let me talk to you for a second. Right. Um, let me sit up. But here again, you can only do that if you have developed a relationship with that student, which is a whole nother conversation. But I would say to answer your question, I feel like that's how I feel like I've benefited the most because there are other ways that I feel like I have, but operating the, the biggest issue that I have faced as a school counselor, transitioning from a, a community mental health um, or a licensed professional counselor is the fact that I can only go but so far right mm. within the school setting. Yeah. Um, I'm used to being able to go, you know, take it all or finish it all the way through. Um, but within school counseling, you can't do therapy. Like, I can't be the school counselor and be the therapist. So that's been somewhat of a, I say, an ongoing issue for me yeah. because when the student starts to open up, it's kind of hard to just stop. Yeah. yeah. So it's hard for me to just say, oh, well, don't, don't tell me about that. Um, let me go ahead and let me see, find Man, these resources for you. The and system um, is so broken. Yeah. It's, it's difficult. Um, but, you know, overall, to get back to your question, because I can no. get long-winded and go, no, go off on a tangent. Good. But um, that's been the, for me, being able to remain calm under any situation has been the, the biggest way that I feel like I've been able to be beneficial in the school um of course for me that's it but for other for for the school it's because i feel like i come in with a wealth of resources and knowledge Mm -hmm. like when students are exhibiting certain behaviors no it's not necessarily that let me talk to them and see because i don't think what you're saying it is Mm -hmm. i think it's more to it Mm -hmm. than just they don't like you there's something that happened that you're probably not thinking about that that student has probably internalized or some things at home that you're not picking up the red flag on that they, mm. that they need assistance with. So being able to address those things, I think, is beneficial for the school in which I work. But for me, just that ability to remain calm, I feel like it's been the best thing for me because I've seen a lot. <laughs> yeah. I've seen a lot. Um, through those years of mental health ex- community mental health experience, I've seen a lot from parents. Yeah. I've seen a lot from the mm-hmm. kids and students of so wow so i want you to stick around for part two and i want to go deeper into the mental health yeah i want to go deeper into the self-care and then some of the ways that you because i imagine in your relationship when we had your wife on mm-hmm. she told us you were the one calling her like honey come home you know what I'm saying? Like, you were the one saying, okay, it's uh, it's 4 o'clock. Okay, it's 5 and 6. Okay, if you don't come home, right, okay, I'm coming to get you. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. so, I, so I want True you to stories. go deeper. Right. <laughs> right. Right. True story. So I want you to go deeper there and then maybe give some tips in part two on how other educators can support, you know, send themselves to their spouses and, you know, that, that mental health piece. So I want to go deeper there with you. Absolutely. In part two. Yeah. Um, you all let us know in the comments. We know you like this episode so far. Stay tuned for part two next week. He's coming back. Mike has more to share. And uh, we'll see y'all next week. Yeah.